book event for this guy. Carlos Martinez here. We got a whole crowd. Let me know how everything sounds because I'm going to put it down here. I am not speaking first. Everyone like the stream? Here's the crowd here at the Marks Memorial Library. So, yeah, give me a sound check though. Let me see. Where's that chat? Where's that chat? Uh, I don't know. We know how to find the chat on this. Okay. Uh, here we go. Chat. All right, let's know how the sound is. How is the sound? It's gonna be here, probably. We'll try to speak up for you. Sounds good, good. How do we look? All right, all right. You know what to do, like, 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 like. Video description has Carlos's book. And we're getting started, so I'm out of here. This is my channel, so just want to make sure it doesn't turn over. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking at that too. This, this camera. You don't really have to look at this one. I mean, if you want, you can. But What's the mic? The mic is this one. The, the mic is in here. The mic is in here for. <laughs> this one is just my channel. People will be able to hear you speak up. It's fine. Let's talk in this channel. Yeah. Oh, talk, yeah? To the, talk to the people. Talk to Rosia. Yeah. Talk to the people. All right. Oh, give, just pass, pass me a book. Thank you. Oh, yeah. You? Depends how you behave. Um, <laughs> that, is, that is 30 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. Yeah, so let's start. Shall we start? Yeah. Okay, so hello everyone. Everyone here in London. Everyone online. So good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending where you are. Hello Jenny, online. So this is a very special book launch. I've never seen a, so many speakers for one book. <laughs> so you must be very special, Carlo. So I'm here to just give you an idea uh, what is going to happen the next 90 minutes. So we will have Carlo talk about his, uh, this amazing book. And then we have five speakers. I'm going to introduce them later individually. But then um, if we have any question, uh, we will have 50 minutes in the end about, I mean, at around 8 o'clock. So if you have any question online, just just type it in. Then we will we will pick up the question later. So shall we? Okay, let me just introduce uh, Carlo. If you still don't know him by now, you should know. So this is the book, the the latest. This is the latest, isn't it? It is indeed. Yeah, uh, I, I think you're working on another book by request. So <laughs> let me just introduce you. Do you want to sit next to me? So people know who you are, who I'm talking to, sure. who I'm talking about. <laughs> So, Carlo, this one, Carlo Martinzi, Martinzi? Martinez. 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 Yeah, sure. Excuse my Spanish, I'm Chinese. What is your name in Chinese? Don't know. Don't know yet. You give, I'll me. give you one later. It's an independent researcher and political activist from London, obviously, the Brit uh, Britain. His first book, The End of the Beginning, Lesson of the Soviet Collapse, was published in 2019 by Left World, Left World Books. He is a co-editor of Friends of Socialist China. I'm sure you, we, we all know, you know this amazing organization and co-founder of No Cold War. So, Carlo, the next 15, 20 minutes is all you, all yours. And I will give you a signal when it's in the two minutes in the left. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Thank all you very to you. much. Right. Can I just check that people online can hear what's going on? And if you want, you can check the chat there too. Okie dokie, right. Sorry for a certain level of chaos and confusion here tonight. 
in addition to organizing this, I'm running the tech and there's tech problems. Apologies. Um, thank you very much, Iris, um, for that very kind introduction. Thank you so much for all the speakers who are here this evening. Uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Rocio Maneiro, um, very, very honored to have you here and uh, looking forward uh, to hearing what you have to say. Uh, Danny Haifong, first time visiting London, first time speaking in London. It's uh, fantastic to have you with us. Uh, comrade Roger McKenzie, um, uh, excellent panelist. Uh, Jenny Clegg online, uh, uh, China expert. And I, again, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you so much to everyone who's come this evening to Mark's Memorial Library, which is um, looking nice and packed. Thanks to everyone online. Um, part of running the tech means that I have to admit people <laughs> into the Zoom meeting. Hello to people um, on the stream, on YouTube, on the Friends of Socialist channel, channel, on Danny's channel. Um, so, a lot of books have been written about China. Why write another one? You know, I looked on the Amazon bestsellers list earlier today for the books that are, you know, really in the spotlight on China. I found titles including Overreach, how China derailed its peaceful rise. Hidden Hand, exposing how the Chinese Communist Party is reshaping the world. Every Breath You Take, China's New Tyranny. Stealth War, how China took over while America's elite slept. So there's a huge, a plethora of books that have been written to persuade you that China is this terrible, authoritarian, dystopian, repressive, aggressive, reactionary state, which is kind of intent on taking over the world, on subverting our democracy and denying freedom to its people. And I wanted to write, I guess, a slightly different book, addressing a slightly different market, a book about China's achievements, a book that presented a positive view of China's foreign policy, of, um, of its multipolar strategy, and a book about the successes of Chinese socialism. That is a significantly less crowded marketplace. In fact, it's quite a lonely marketplace. Um, so there are two key motivations for writing this book, um, and they overlap to some degree. The first one is to counter the propaganda war against China, which is intense and which forms part of uh, an escalating new Cold War of encirclement and containment of China. You know, the, the most awful slanders are being hurled at China. Oh, sorry, got to let people in. Thank you. The most awful slanders are being hurled at China. Um, China's engaged in a genocide against the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. China's engaged in cultural genocide. China's cracking down on righteous democratic protests. China's restricting religious freedoms. China's restricting linguistic freedoms. It's preventing the people of Xinjiang, of Tibet, of Qinghai, of Inner Mongolia from speaking their traditional languages. China's engaged in, is luring the countries of Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean and the Pacific and the Middle East into debt traps. Um, they're spying on us, you know, China's stealing our jobs, China's stealing our technology, they're preparing for war over Taiwan, China hates our freedom, and so on. You know, China is the number one bad guy of today, the global bad guy, the global enemy. And it's very important, I think, for us to understand, especially in anti-war circles, especially in progressive circles, that this propaganda war is a form of war propaganda. Its aim is to buy, uh, is to manufacture us a consent for Cold War and ultimately, quite possibly, hot war against China. And that's about, you know, a, a US ruling class predominantly that's dead set on maintaining its hegemony, maintaining its dominance, maintaining a US-centric, US-led imperialist world system, um, or what's sometimes referred to as a project for a new American century, or as Hillary Clinton herself called it in 2011 or so, the uh, America's Pacific Century. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some people in the room today would be older and old enough to remember the original Cold War, and there's a lot of parallels between this new Cold War and the original Cold War. In many ways, you could say that what we're experiencing today is a continuation of the Cold War, like what was that original Cold War all about? It was a two-pronged thing. 
uh, based on attacking and attempting to dismantle socialism and the socialist camp, and also attacking the global south, the developing world, attacking the notion of sovereignty, the notion of countries exercising their independence and exploring their own development paths outside of the imperialist system. So that involved, in relation to the Soviet Union and its allies, sanctioning, you know, engaging in an arms race, trying to suppress its economic development, reduce its influence in the world, you know, trying to roll back the October Revolution, trying to weaken and defeat socialism, trying to roll back the Chinese Revolution, trying to roll back the Cuban Revolution. At the level of the global south, the developing countries, that took the form of wars, proxy wars, destabilization, assassinations, coups, economic coercion, sanctions, you know, anything and everything to prevent the countries of the global south asserting their sovereignty, as I said, choosing their own development path. And we call it a Cold War, and it's a somewhat innocuous sounding term, but the Cold War got very hot. You know, in Korea, three million at least people died, um, and they lost their lives because, you know, why was it? It was because the US insisted on maintaining a, a military foothold in the Pacific in order to best impose its hegemony over the region. It insisted on maintaining military bases in South Korea and in Japan and in Okinawa and in Guam. It insisted on hosting nuclear warheads in the region so that the US could threaten North Korea and People's China and the Soviet Union with nuclear annihilation so that the US could maintain its client dictatorship in Taiwan province so that the US could prevent the People's Republic of China from gaining its rightful place at the United Nations. Several more million people lost their lives in Vietnam because the US couldn't accept the choice of the people of Vietnam and the people of Laos and the people of <coughs> Cambodia to pursue a, a socialist development path, to align themselves with the socialist camp, to exist outside that Western sphere of influence. So in Indonesia, in Brazil, in Nicaragua, in Chile, in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, in Nicaragua, and so many other countries, shocking number of lives were sacrificed at the altar of the so-called rules-based international order. So, you know, people shouldn't think that just because it's a Cold War that it's this innocuous and harmless thing. Um, and, you know, the, the new Cold War in its current form hasn't reached those levels of violence and chaos. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not a threat. And actually, the, the threat of World War III is increasing by the day. We can see it's like abundantly clear that the US and its allies are perfectly happy to fight to the last Ukrainian in their proxy war against Russia. So, you know, in addition to the economic attacks on China, in addition to the sanctions, the tariffs, the trade war, these desperate attempts to prevent China emerging as a, a semiconductor power, um, the attacks on Huawei, on TikTok, on WeChat, and so on, there's also uh, a systematic attempt at military encirclement. You know, we've seen the emergence of the AUKUS nuclear pact between Britain, the US, and Australia, the provision of direct military aid to Taiwan province, which is a clear violation of the One China Principle, um, this vast and expanding array of military bases in the region, including a new base in Darwin in North Australia, the placement of nuclear-enabled warplanes in Japan, in South Korea, in Okinawa, the third missile defense system in Guam and South Korea, attempts to revive, re revive the Quad, the encouragement of Japanese rearmament. So none of this is peaceful, none of this is cold, or none of, it's, you know, none of it has a peaceful purpose. There's quite clear clearly a, a vocal and a strong and an influential faction in Washington that sees an outright war with China as the only viable means of stopping China's rise, of preventing China from taking over from the US as the world's biggest economy, of, of reducing China's influence in the world, um, and ultimately of putting an end to this emerging multipolar world order that really has China at its core. So, as I said, you know, the propaganda war is about enrolling public opinion for this new Cold War and potentially hot war against China, and we mustn't allow our consent to be manufactured, and that's one of the main reasons that I wrote the book. 
The other major reason um, for writing The East is, red, is Still Red is that, well, I'm a Marxist, I'm a supporter of socialism, and China is, in my opinion, a socialist country that's led by a Marxist party. And that's a subject that's incredibly badly understood, including on the left. Um, and it just makes so little sense to me that you have people on the left, socialist, communist, Marxist, progressive, that either deny China's achievements or see China's achievements and want to ascribe them not to socialism, but to capitalism. You know, China has engaged in what the UN has defined as the world's most successful and extensive <coughs> poverty alleviation campaign in history. Uh, 850 million people, according to World Bank figures, have been pulled out of poverty. And that doesn't only mean going above a very low income level, so you know, $1.90 or whatever it is, that also means guaranteed access to housing, guaranteed access to food, clothing, education, healthcare, clean water, and modern energy. In a lot of parts of the developing world, that's essentially being middle income. Um, so, you know, while the US and its allies have been waging wars around the world, China's been waging war on poverty. Like, do people really imagine that if China were just a regular capitalist country, if the capitalist class, like a small number of people who own and deploy capital, dominated political power in China, it would be possible to direct all of those massive resources towards the needs of ordinary working people, indeed towards the needs of the poorest people um, in society. China's emerged as a global leader in renewable energy, in biodiversity, in ad addressing pollution, building green transport systems and so on. Yeah, if you look at what's happened in the West, if you look at what's happened in Britain, in the US, in Canada, in the EU, it's, we've made practically no change. There were no, practically no progress on addressing the questions of climate breakdown in the last 30 years. You know, it was at the Rio summit in 1992 that the countries of the world collectively agreed that there was a very serious problem that had to be addressed together through collective action. And what did we do? We left it to the market. You know, we adopted neoliberal orthodoxy, free, free market fundamentalism. We said, well, the profit motive is going to fix this problem. The dynamics of supply and demand are going to fix this problem. And they haven't. The problem's got a lot worse because actually we've been burning a hell of a lot, a hell of, a lot of fossil fuels in the last 30 years. So, but meanwhile in China, there's been really serious progress made. Like China has installed more renewable energy capacity than all of the G7 countries combined. Um, in the last two decades, coal has gone from 80% of China's energy mix to under 50%. Um, forest coverage has increased from 12% uh, to 23%. So it's essentially doubled in the course of the last few decades. China produces 98% of the world's electric buses. It produces 70% of the world's high-speed rail. And it's set these um, yeah, ex extremely ambitious targets to peak carbon consumption by 2030 and to get to net zero by 2060. And China has a certain tendency of reaching its targets. So again, like, do people really think this would be possible if China were a capitalist country, if the capitalist class was in control, and if they left the, the solution of all problems to the market? So. In my book, I posit that the reason that China's the world leader in poverty alleviation, the reason that it's the world leader in the green transition, the reason that it follows a, a foreign policy based on peace, on mutual benefit and cooperation, on non-interference, on respect for sovereignty, the reason it's been able to deal with COVID so much more effectively than you know, all of the major Western capitalist countries, the reason it's been able to go from being one of the, the poorest, one of the most backward technologically speaking, countries in the world to being a moderately prosperous country today, to being a science and technology uh, superpower, powerhouse today, um, is precisely that it's ultimately a socialist country. It's a country that has a government with a worldview based on Marxism, on historical materialism, a country where political power represents the masses of the people rather than a wealthy elite. You know, it's, it's kind of understandable that people are pretty confused about China because you look at China and there are a lot of things that you don't particularly associate with, with socialism. There's huge volumes of private capital. There's massive inequality. There are billionaires. 
there's exploitation of labor, there's Western brands, you know, there's KFC, there's Starbucks, there's McDonald's, there's stock markets, there's integration into US-led global value chains. You know, the whole vibe is certainly very different from the 1960s. However, you know, the bottom line is that, you know, even as the rich have got a lot richer, all of society has also got much wealthier, lives a whole lot better than they used to. And the country continues to be governed primarily in the interests of ordinary people. And the major party government is a communist party. It's an organization of nearly 100 million members that takes Marxism very seriously. Yes, they've introduced various market-based measures in order to advance their productivity, in order to try and catch up with the West in terms of science and technology, to attract investment, to grow their economy, to improve living standards, and ultimately to try and create conditions for an advance to a, a, a higher level of socialism. You have to say, if the proof of the pudding is in the eating, well, they've been massively successful. And I don't think there's a lot of people in China who regret or who negate that process. Are there risks involved in the approach that they're taking and that they've been taking since 1978? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are massive risks in what they do, but also we live in a world do that continues to be dominated by imperialism, you know, which hasn't fundamentally changed in its overall geopolitical structure for the last 200 years. There's, you know, in that world, there's no socialist development path that's free of dangers and threats and difficulties. And that's as true of Venezuela and Cuba and Korea and Laos and Vietnam and Nicaragua as it is of China. So, you know, that's the other central motivation for writing this book is to say, um, you know, if we're socialists, if we uphold socialism as a better path for humanity, why on earth would we? We want to ascribe China's successes to capitalism rather than socialism. Um, China's the largest, the most advanced socialist country that's making historic progress, as I've said, on poverty, on green energy, on putting forward a global vision based on peace and common prosperity. Let's celebrate that. Let's learn from it. Let's take some inspiration from it. Um, let's build solidarity with China. Let's reject the propaganda war. Let's reject the new Cold War. Let's reject imperialist aggression. Um, yeah, so that's essentially why I wrote the book, and I hope it provides some value for people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Quite a good snapshot, I think, with your book. So I can judge. <laughs> um, quite a good snapshot of your, of your book. And your book has got a lot of statistics. It's very important to know all, all these, you know, um, stats and facts to debunk all this propaganda. So the next speaker, my friend, Roger, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, sure. So Roger McKenzie is a journalist and trade union unionist, international editor of the Morning Star, got it right, sorry. And a long time campaigner for labor rights and racial equality as well as a proud internationalist and socialist. All yours, Roger. Okay, um, thank you uh, very much. I, I feel a real fraud, actually. Um, I feel like, um, I don't know if you've heard of Stephen Gerrard, um, but when he became manager of Aston Villa, he was like, he, he was like, he just got into this gig that he shouldn't have got into. You know, I feel a bit like that today, really, with all this with the platform that, that I'm speaking on. Um, I wanna congratulate Carlos on his book, um, which I think is an outstanding contribution um, to what I think is a, is a really difficult issue. And what I'm gonna do in just a few minutes is just to explain three of the issues that, that I think um, may, maybe we need to think a little bit about. The first thing, and Carlos mentioned this, was about the propaganda war. Um, that we're in. And I, I think that's a, that's a really interesting uh, kind of thing to think about. So every morning um, I have to look at the, the wires. I have to think about what stories I'm going to cover um, for the Morning Star. And over the last few months in particular, I mean, it was always bad, but actually over the last few months, you've seen a real change um, in the attitudes um, that's coming through um, things like Associated Press and Reuters and all of them. 
Um, it's just got worse and worse. And some of the language that they use um, towards um, China is really quite instructive. More and more about um, militarism. More and more about um, they will, you know, their in absolute intention is, is to take on the United States. will ignore completely the way that the United States is behaving at the minute. Um, so in, in tomorrow's paper, um, you'll, you'll see a piece from me that talks about um, the way that there was a meeting that took place between uh, um, really senior diplomats from the US and China in the last few days, where they said they had a candid discussion, um, but constructive discussion. Now, years ago, that used to be called a free and frank exchange of views which meant that they had a bit of a row, but m maybe they found a way forward to be able to um, really have a conversation with each other. But a prime part of that discussion was the way that the United States goes thousands and thousands of miles to um, take its warships up the Taiwan Straits. Thousands of miles. And they think that's all right. And I just keep thinking, oh, I'm no expert, but I think, I wonder what would happen if China took its warships through near Hawaii or Puerto Rico. I wonder what would happen. I don't think they'd be very pleased. I mean, I think we saw the, their kind of attitude when this weather balloon um, happened to, to go over, which now they're saying isn't, what was it, an unfortunate or something Biden was saying now? Um, just, what, was, what was it? A silly incident. A silly incident. Right, well, damn right, it was silly. It was pathetic actually. So the, my point for raising these issues is the way that that is covered by the media and why I think the, um, the way that we cover these stories in the Morning Star and the way that other progressive newspapers need to be really, really careful about the way they cover these stories is because I think it's really easy to get sucked into this easy language that attacks China and paints the United States as this really good guy who's actually just the leader of the free world and trying to do their thing to make sure everybody has a better place um, in the world. Um, and actually just a cursory glance at the economic situation in the United States will tell you all that you need to know about where the priorities are within the United States and the levels of poverty, the levels of homelessness. Um, the way that all the priorities of the United States, um, even this debt ceiling discussion that took place last week, which attacked working class people, was all about making sure that big oil, you know, those major polluters um, can get away with carrying on polluting um, the world. So the propaganda war is one of the areas um, that I think is interesting. One of the areas that I don't think gets talked about enough is the racism within all of this as well. And I don't mean just the racism towards China, as bad as that is, because actually what people forget is that these politicians and the newspapers, the media, can come out with all their stuff all the time, but there's always a consequence for the language that people use. There is always a consequence. And it's a consequence for the Chinese people, not just in the United States, but also across the rest of the world as well. We get it in the UK as well. And I see it as a black person, you know, it just takes one um, Tory politician, or frankly, Labour politician, to come out and say some rubbish. And we get attacked the next day. And that's what happens. So I think there needs to be more of a discussion about the racist background to a lot of the way that China's viewed um, by um, uh, uh, places like the, the United States as well. The final point that I wanted to, um, to make is about um, the alleviation of poverty. So if you're sitting there... Oh, sorry, let me just trot back a minute about this, um, about the racism, because one of the... The things that it also forgets is the it forgets to talk about the racism that's attached to um, people of uh, in the global south, um, because there's an assumption that people of the global south have no earthly idea what they're talking about when they want to have uh, a relationship with China, and that doesn't just come about 
from nowhere. That comes about because we're black people, people of colour, and you can't possibly understand the global political um, realities of life because you don't understand and know your place. And I think we have to factor some of that into our discussions as well. That whole racism that underlies the whole approach um, to the notion that the people of the global south should be able to have a relationship with whoever they want, whenever they want, and however they want, and not just at the um, behest of whatever the United States insists that they do. And I think this is really important when we look at um, de-dollarisation and the impact that that will have, the potential new currency um, that will come about through the BRICS. I think that's a major achievement because one of the things it does is it slaps the United States right in the place where they hurt the most in their pockets. It slams them the most with the impact that the dollar has in terms of its um, power um, across the world. They will not be able to introduce sanctions so easily against so many countries in the way that they do now. They know that and that's why they're part of the reason why they are attacking uh, the global south right now. Final point I want to make, it does, does relate to, to poverty. So imagine you're sitting there in the global south and you're having a conversation with a nation that has just removed near on a billion people out of poverty. Are you going to say, when you look at the situation that your country is in, where you are struggling against climate change, you are struggling against wars that have been promoted by the United States and their allies, are you going to sit there and just think, well, you know what, not really interested um, in that. Not really interested. Now, I'm not saying for a minute that there aren't some really poor governments um, in the global south because there absolutely are and they need to be removed and but replaced by progressive governments. But no country is going to miss out on the opportunity to find a way of bringing their nation out of some of the most gut-wrenching poverty that exists on this planet. Nobody is going to give up on the opportunity to do that. So I think that one of the things that's great about this book is that it, it gives us hope. And for me, that's one of the great things ever as socialists that we should be talking about. Um, you know, find it as many ways of giving, not just ourselves who come here and talk with each other all the time about hope, but thinking about the hope that there's people out there um, across the world, particularly, I think, across the global south, who are hoping for a different way, um, looking for a different way um, of doing things. And I think that this book is a great contribution towards that, Carlos, and I want to thank you um, for being able to, um, to work um, on this book, and I look forward to the, to the next books um, about um, that carry on the dialogue, because I'm pretty sure that, that what we're seeing here today is the beginning... Um, of a dialogue about how we can move forward, not just through China and just trying to think, well, China's the knight in shining armour that's going to come to everybody's rescue, but in partnership, a genuine multilateral partnership across the world that gives everybody a sense of pride, give people a sense of hope and gives everybody a chance um, to move forward. Thanks ever so much for listening. Only one five minutes. And how long did I take? Yeah, you spot on ten minutes. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, no, one, I just want to say, it's no such thing. Imposter syndrome. You know, I champion. Or you, some of you might know diversity. You know, your lived experience, and I'm so with you on racism. This, you know, huh? What are we going to do with it? Action. If you want to fast chat, look at read chapter seven. Read chapter seven, then you you got some kind of idea. We need action. So, next speaker, we have, I hope I pronounce her name <laughs> not too badly, Her Excellency Rocio Malemo. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Venezuelan ambassador to the UK, ably representing wow, 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 revolutionary. How can I not you know, say this, this word? Rational. Revolutionary Venezuela here for the last several years. She previously served for several years as Venezuelan ambassador to China. 
accompany Hugo Chavez on some of his visits. So, welcome. It's all yours, Her Excellency. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, first of all, good evening, cameras. And let me, let me express my gratitude to Carlos for inviting me to say some words at the occasion of the launch of his book, The East is Still Red. This is an honor for me. Can you speak a bit louder, please? This is an honor for me. Even more so as it is held here at the Karmas Library, giving it a special historical transcendence. This is a relevant book. My predecessor said something very beautiful. He said, this book gave us hope. That's, that's very nice. Well, for me, it's a relevant book, and I will explain why. When China decided to, ho to open up to the Western world, a step it took, in my opinion, in this century, because what China did in the 20th century was to peek through the window and start planning a route. Well, when China decided to open up to the world, a number of sinologists or sinologists, uh, China specialists, showed up in the West, trying to explain China's complexity with Western theories and principles. I read at least five of those books published by scholars. I remember one of them having more than 400 pages. Those were the days when I was preparing for the task given to me by President Chavez. I was to become the ambassador of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela to the People's Republic of China. When I, when I arrived in China in 2004, nothing of what I had read was of any use to me. <laughs> <laughs> Only the books relating China's culture, those great particularities of a civilization that goes back three to, th to 5,000 years, and is still alive. Apart from that, the rest was totally useless, mainly because it had little to do with the facts, with what I was seeing and experiencing in China. Carlos' book has the relevance, the value, to present a different hypothesis to explain what China means to the world today. It is a book that <coughs> equates with what I lived during those nine years I spent as ambassador in Beijing from 2004 to 2013. In those years, I had the privilege, as did all, all my colleagues, ambassadors, to witness how the international balance of power shifted from west to east due to the force applied by China. From those years of hard work and learning, if one thing became clear to me, 
it was that China's greatness is rooted in two factors. Discipline, which comes from the teachings of Confucius, and a collective purpose, which is at the heart of communism. The union of those two factors is, in my opinion, the most objective, rigorous, and real starting point to approach to the truth of China. A nation which was reborn and liberated in 1949 a nation with defeat, which defeated hunger with an enormous effort considered today as a true political and socioeconomic miracle of universal history. A nation which today plays the protagonist, protagonist role as an international player in every field, a nation, and to me, this is the most important, which designed a foreign policy based on equality, a win-win formula to teach imperialism how to move forward in creating a new world in peace, not with armed intervention, but with diplomacy and negotiation guided by a collective purpose. I congratulate Carlos because he dares to approach such a complex subject, opposing the opposition of Western experts experts, and also based on concrete facts. After reading his book, it is almost impossible to affirm that socialism as a political system is a failure. Muchas gracias, Carlos. One of the very few Spanish I can speak. Muchas gracias. Indeed. So our next speaker is Danny Hyphon. Danny is an independent journalist and broadcaster from, from the US. He's a long time columnist with Black, Black A Agenda Report and CGTN and has in recent years built a substantial following on his uh, ge geopolitics Hyphon channel on YouTube. He is a co-editor of Friends of Socialist China and the author of the book American Exceptionalism and American Innocent. Is it Innocent? In, in 2019. Uh, but I must say, I need to point out in the book, there is an amazing bonus week in the appendix. My God, you know, it's so much information. Must read as well. So, Danny, all yours. All right, all right. It's good to be in London. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you to the Marx Memorial Library and to moderator Iris Yao. Thank you so much for doing this. And of course, thanks to Carlos, who wrote this incredible book. So you can get this if you're watching online, Praxis Press, or in the description of this video here that I'm recording. And of course, we have a lot of copies here, so definitely pick one up. It's a lot of labor, and I know Carlos, he put a lot of work into this book. And so I'm so happy to do this with Carlos because I've known him for many years now, and I can tell you that he is one of the most motivated comrades and colleagues that I have ever met. I mean, he is committed to building this new world. 
in helping all of us understand China being at the center of it because it's in birth. We are witnessing a new world in birth. Uh, Iris Yao mentioned the appendix of the book. It's a co-authored article that we wrote for International Critical Thought on democracy and understanding Chinese democracy versus liberal Western democracy. And, uh, you know, it was a joy to work with him on that. And also we got to go to China together for two and a half weeks right before COVID, which was one of the most eye-opening experiences that I've ever had in my life, uh, similar uh, to Her Excellency. Uh, I had to throw out everything that I had learned about China, witnessing the progress, witnessing the development, witnessing all of the achievements that China has been able to make over the course of the last 70 plus years. So I want to focus today on China, multipolarity, and what really is a collapsing Western-led world order, a world order that's led by the United States, uh, but uh, really the United States is just dragging the rest of the West along to what is a suicidal mission to contain China. And so oftentimes, right, and I think Carlos does a great job on this, he he hits on the left, like the, the Western left's limitations in understanding China. And that's very important. But there's also this more mainstream look at geopolitics in general from all across the political spectrum that I find even more problematic in some respects, where we hear a lot of how the United States, the Biden administration, the Trump administration before that, they talk about China as a competitor, a strategic competitor or a peer competitor. And it's looked at in this very abstract way. So China is looked at as kind of like another corporation, the U.S. being one big corporation, the China the other. And it's just devouring, right? That they're devouring each other. And we're supposed to look at this as very narrow in a very abstract way. And what I think this takes away from is the reality of the situation where uh, Roger put it really well, I think, that China being really a beacon of hope. Right, a beacon of hope for the global south. And how socialism does play a huge role in that because socialism really does direct China's foreign policy. Multipolarity is not simply, while China would never champion socialism as the uh, uh, objective ideological force of the project, certainly socialism informs it. And uh, I think we must study this development very deeply. Because, you know, there are those in the ruling class, in the elite, that have kind of admitted as such the limitations of their own understanding of China. So you hear a lot about, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative. Well, you can look at mainstream sources to this. The Chatham House, which is this State Department funded think tank, they talk about the Belt and Road Initiative as actually beneficial to the global south with some smears in there but they talk about it like this the australian strategic policy institute roger brought up the propaganda war i mean they're at the top of it they get defense department spending from the united states and australia all the military contractors fund them and they talk all about uyghur genocide and oppression and all of this making up all these lies but even they have to admit just how much China has progressed technologically and why the U.S. should be very worried. And I think we can even just look at these hot issues right now, whether it's Ukraine, always in the news, right? Because it's it really is an example of you, the U.S. and NATO being stood up to by Russia. And, you know, Ukraine is being used in this very cynical way to try to forward NATO expansion. And, and, and Taiwan is kind of like this uh, a peer issue for the United States. They want to use Taiwan, similar to Ukraine. They want to use it as this proxy to spark a larger war. And you've had many leaks from the U.S.'s uh, echelons of their defense uh, department and their military apparatus say as much that Taiwan is all about leading into a war with China. But what often doesn't get asked when we look at geopolitics very narrowly as peer competition, great power competition, is why would the United States want to cross these red lines? Like, Why does it want to uh, uh, bring Russia into war with Ukraine? But more importantly, why is Taiwan just talked about so much in 
con you know, in conjunction with this issue. And it's because China is an alternative. It is a, a, a country that is building something different. It isn't, if it were truly about just China's economic rise and China devouring the world in, con you know, in conjunction and competition with the United States, then we would ask ourselves, why didn't the United Kingdom, why didn't Great Britain, after the fall of its empire, World War II, why didn't it protest against the United States and say, we want our colonies back, we want our dominance back? They didn't do that. That didn't happen. It, right now, we have a situation where the West is very much so in service to the United States. It's, but China is different. China is not just bigger. China is different. China's rise is about much more. It's about an openly socialist model that is adored by 1.4 billion people whose leadership is unafraid of charting their own course of history and of opposing and openly opposing the interference of the United States and the West and anyone into anyone else's affairs. And so China is leading opposition to sanctions. China is leading uh, the opposition to unilateral warfare, regardless of who wages it. And China is just not alleviating poverty and building all of this incredible infrastructure like high-speed rail and renewable energy for itself. China has really foregrounded a model of global leadership where genuine cooperation and peaceful development offer the global majority a, a hope and vision of what it means to win together in opposition to the U.S.'s zero-sum game. The zero-sum game that they play where only a tiny few individuals and corporations and ultimately nations benefit. So, you know, this U.S.-led aggressive posture towards China, this policy which Carlos outlines really well in multiple chapters in the book, uh, it really is a war on multipolarity and a war on socialism. It's a war on people of the world, oppressed people, working people, building mechanisms, building institutions, uh, building true sovereignty to free themselves from the chains of what has been a global imperial nightmare. That's what geopolitics really is about. It's about understanding what causes these contradictions. And I think Carlos really outlines it very well. I mean, we have now China leading these incredible efforts through organizations like BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is huge. Uh, you have the Belt and Road Initiative, its own project, 145 plus countries engage in thousands of projects in cooperation with China to build infrastructure, true infrastructure, high-speed rail, to build bridges. And the examples are numerous. The Sino Lao Railway, which was launched just over a year ago, has changed dramatically the landscape of this small, landlocked, socialist country which was bombed into the Stone Age by the United States during the invasion of Vietnam. And it was China who had to demine hundreds of explosives planted all across the country just to build this railway. Uh, you have China building hundreds of kilometers worth of highways in uh, Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, which has connected these countries to the European market and allowed for them to grow in a period where, after the fall of the Soviet Union, they became some of the poorest countries in the world, completely cut off from much of the world economy. Uh, you have China building the first urban metro system in Lahore, Pakistan. So you have all of these examples, not to mention the fact that China diplomatically is brokering peace between countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran. So. This is what the United States, where I hail from, uh, and the collective West, the UK being a big part of that, that's what they're built to destroy, all of this. And it's really important to understand why this is happening. It's, it's because, not just because China is becoming bigger, overtake, it'll overtake the United States in GDP terms very soon, 2030, 2035, whenever it happens, 
it's not the principal reason. Yeah, the United States is angry. The West is angry. They wish they could be on top forever. But the point of the fact matter is, is that it is because China offers a different way of life. If it didn't, you would, you would see a lot more double dealing. You would see a lot more attempts to work with China than not. And I think Carlos does a great job of understanding, analyzing the reasons for why China has been targeted in this way. And so you should definitely pick up this book and to understand why geopolitics is about a clash of systems and not simply about this narrow competition between countries vying for power in this abstract way. So thanks to Carlos and thanks to all of you for coming. Appreciate you hearing me talk about this. Thank you, Danny. So our next speaker is online. Jenny Claire, are you there? Yes, of course. Hi, so, Iris. Hello. Uh, thanks, Danny. Right, so, okay, let me just do it. Well, really, don't really need introduction, Jenny Claire. But anyway, I do it, Jenny. <laughs> Jenny um, is an independent writer and researcher former in senior lecturer in inter international study and long-time China specialist, author of China, China's Global Strategy, Towards a Multipolar World, 2009, long before you know, this crazy thing happened. So you're already advocating multipolar. An activist in peace and anti-war movement in Britain, she is also an advisory group member of Friends of Social Socialist China. So all yours, Jenny. Thank you very much, Jaris. And um, hi, Carlos. Many congratulations for this book. I really don't know where you found the time to do it. Um, well, I want to start by going back to 2017, uh, when following Trump's election, Xi Jinping made a landmark <coughs> observation that the world is in the midst of great changes unseen in a century. At that time, there were only a handful of us on the left here in Britain seriously following China, connecting now and then with a few other individuals in Europe, in North America. But as Trump went on to unleash his trade and technology wars, disrupting 40 relatively tranquil years of US-China engagement, we found ourselves deluged in hostility, struggling to stay sane in an environment awash with crazy lies and disinformation about the Hong Kong so-called democracy movement, the Uyghurs, the so-called Wuhan virus. Sinophobia had been let out of the box into the general public. We began to network. Then came Pompeo's speech at the Nixon Center in July 2020. <coughs> Securing our freedoms from the Chinese Communist Party is the mission of our time, he declared. Our network sprang into action. First, no Cold War. Then, the International Manifesto Group, initiated by Radhika Desai, whose book on coronavirus, capitalism and war we launched, we launched here just over a month ago, and also Friends of Socialist China. At the heart of all this activity was Carlos, technician-in-chief, social media master, networker extraordinaire, pulling together panels from across continents, and not just the man in the engine room, but one of the key architects in shaping the arguments to challenge the anti-China narratives. So reading the book for me is a bit like reliving the last few years as the debates and discussions develop. Countering the line of neither Washington nor Beijing with an analysis of the new Cold War. Exposing the myth of Uyghur genocide as manufactured campaign based on manufactured evidence. Marking the 100th of 2020, sorry, 2021 with the eradication of poverty, the story of survival even as the Soviet Union collapsed. 2021 also saw the hostile spotlight trained on China at COP26, and then in 2022, 
Biden unleashed his aggressive ideological war of world division. With this book, Carlos does battle with the new Cold War, doing a real service in covering these bases in a clear, readable and thorough fashion. The arguments are solid, grounded in facts and supported by judicious academic reference, demolishing the China as imperialist contention, exposing the superficiality of the notion of Deng's capitalist restoration, revealing step by step how Ch behind China's spectacular rise lies the socialist direction taken forward by a communist party applying Marxism as it prioritizes the interests of the people, albeit a path that took some wild zigzags before reaching a workable balance between state and market, class struggle, and developing the productive forces. So this is all in the book, but also um, we find here a series of carefully selected quotes uh, as an introduction to the thinking of the CPC. So I'd like to make some observation about how I see uh, using the book as I look at it uh, from here in the West, in Britain. For myself, I'm not so bothered about defending China. China can look after itself. It is those of us trapped amidst these increasingly ruthless capitalist decay that I worry about. With the burdens of economic failure piling up on people, China is being presented as an existential threat to the Western way of life, preparing a climate of war. The lies and misinformation raise anxieties amidst dramatic global events. But more than this, these lies disempower, cutting people off, not only from China, but generally also from the global south with their more positive views of the country's growing strength. It is not possible now to understand what is happening in the world without understanding China, how it hastens multipolarity as a context for anti-imperialism of our time, opening spaces for progressive solutions to global crises and indeed for socialism. As China and the global south generally start to take off together in these new directions, people in the west are being hoodwinked out of their future, left isolated from potential alternatives, trapped in the cold attack of racist myths about the indispensable West. With people uncertain about the future, the left meanwhile is fragmented, unable to help them find a way out of their predicament. As Carlos makes clear, much of the Western left tends to absorb and reflect the misdirections of the Western political classes. There is opportunism, there is ultra-leftism, as well as so social democratic rightism. There is the deep-rooted Western centrism, and, but altogether, there is a lack of grounding. The job of the left is to find the way forward by consolidating the lessons of history. And this is important because it is the way address people's problems appropriate to the times. Unless it grasps this context, the Western left risks getting left behind as the multipolar trend begins to shift US hegemonism and imperialism towards the margins. Without this particular context for advance, calls for international solidarity of the working class are reduced to empty utopian sloganizing. So for me, it is not that China's socialist path is our path. The need to clear away the debris of misinformation and distraction, as I see it, is so as to understand how China is shaping our context of multipolarity. That is, to understand the meaning of China's rise. That meaning is rooted in China's long-term socialist trajectory. Significantly, Carlos demonstrates this, showing the underlying continuity between Deng and Mao and the 1949 revolution, as well as nailing down the differences between Gorbachev and Deng Xiaoping in their approach to reform and opening up. The point of these discussions is to provide that historical grounding essential to understanding the meaning of China, situating China 
and socialism in the context in which anti-imperialism seeks to advance in the world. Only pointing to the changes ahead for China, the path towards common prosperity, internationally, the dangers of US militarization. And now for me, the relentlessness of Biden's militarized splitting of the world is getting quite frightening. Kissinger gives a US-China war five to 10 years, but the risk is growing ever more present. The U.S. has convinced itself that China is in, sorry, the U.S. political elite has convinced itself that China is intent on taking over the world. And this, of course, is the particular characteristic of the racism of Sinophobia, which is that behind every Chinese is a demonic Manchu, the same in 1911 as today. Um, at the same time, amidst the West failures, the pace of multipolarization is breathtaking. So anyway, the point that I'm trying to make here is that I don't think it's about forging a clique of true believers, a China is best sect. If the book is a weapon against the new Cold War, I would see it as a guide within the left, a tool for activists to get ready to grasp those great changes that, that Xi Jinping saw unfolding. So to all of you, um, I say here are the key arguments, here is the basis. Read, digest, catch up. The networks need to grow exponentially. And to Carlos, stay abreast of the pace of change. I know it's a huge amount of work, a day-to-day -day pressure, but just keep it up. More chapters are waiting to be written, even as we speak. We got it. We got the message. People, listen. Action. We can no longer rely on watching at this mainstream. We need to be. We need to work harder. This critical thinking. Just don't take the keywords or the slogan. Take it up. The steps per capita, whatever. Just need to be. Just need to work harder. We can do it. We're more. We are, we are better than that. More intelligent than that. So thank you to Jenny again. So now we are going to open up to the floor for questions. Question people, and I really want to take questions from people of Chinese heritage, female especially. And I was <laughs> just to say, we're reliant on the microphone, internal microphone in this computer. So, so they will have to come here? People have to come here. Ah. Or if it's just a short question, they can say it and we can repeat it from here. So now come here, come here be, to be, be seen. So question, anyone? Please? Yes, please. Would you like to come over? Right. Do you want to sit here? The question. Okay, sure. As you make this feature, it's the computer that's not picked up. Can I just say this? We will come. I would like to make a quick observation and ask Carlos to comment. So no, come here, come here, be, be, be seen. So question, anyone? My my observation, Please? my observation is that. Would you like to come over? Sorry. Just wait. Yeah. No, I don't waste. I don't waste your time. Okay. My obs my observation is that while it is correct, while it is correct to say that the vast majority of the port class does not seem to understand China. I repeat, while a vast majority of the political class are, are, is correct to say that they have lack understanding of China, nevertheless, socialism, strategically, socialism is in direct contradiction to capitalism. This is inevitable, as Marxists will know. Therefore, the people at the very top in the West, they do understand China. My view is that it is not that they don't, don't understand China. It is because they do understand China that the triumph of socialism is a direct contradiction of capitalism and will see the collapse of capitalism. That is why they are all out to demonize China. So I'm the reverse 
the concept and remind people, and here I'm talking about activists, I'm not talking about the ordinary people, activists, that we should know that the top 1% fully understand China, fully understand that strategically socialism is in direct contradiction to capitalism, and this 1% will die in historical terms. And that is why they are. Uh, so I want Carlos to comment on this. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any questions, contributions? Don't be shy. Rich? Okay, just, just you, you'll have to come here, though. Sorry. Just say that those of us who are questioned about China, and my son lived there for a while, but um, I, I've never been there, and I'm looking forward to reading Carlos's book. Um, three of the issues that regularly come up. One is the existence of capitalists, an issue of whether they form a class or not. The other one is the uh, very small number of women in the uh, last party congress, I think 8%, and I think there are now no women on, on the presidium of the Communist Party uh, of China. Um, and they are key issues, and people do, um, do constantly raise those, and I'm just hoping that Carlos's book will, um, uh, will give me the ammunition to answer them. That's all. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Would you like to take one more question? Then, uh, um, yes, I think Sarah Flounders wanted to raise a question from the floor. Sarah, are you unmuted? Ah, oh, no, he's trying to sound like oh, Thank you. Okay. Very much. Um, um, Okay, go ahead, Sarah. Uh, first, to thank Carlos for an incredible, incredible yes, uh, book and very, very valuable. Uh, I just returned from uh, China and the greatest part of our time, uh, it was a visit with the China-U.S. Solidarity Network, who was our visit to Xinjiang, uh, to both Marimshi and to Kashgar and uh, I, I, areas that you also visited um, just before the um, shutdown in, in 2019. So I wanted to ask you a bit about uh, your response to the continuing responses of the U.S. genocide. Uh, and just to say in short, um, that instead of martial law and massive police presence and lockdown and fear, we did see packed, absolutely packed marketplaces tourists in the tens of thousands, no longer Western tourists, now Chinese people are visiting uh, Xinjiang in great numbers, uh, but the subway lines and the crafts and the foods and all of that was really, and, and the mechanized agriculture, but, but to ask you to, to deal with this uh, a little bit more also, because uh, this is one of the main political propaganda charges that we're hearing all the time. And thank you for your book. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, Francisco and uh, the comrade over here, um, please come to the front. Your book is just falling. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Had to happen. <laughs> Nothing is going there. Make sure they stand. Get the camera. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what is fascinating about China, I'm not going to make a speech, this refers to my question. What is fascinating about China is the fact that it's been able to, one, develop massively, it's done it with equity, with complexities, and it is in the global south. In other words, this appeared impossible a few years ago. So my question is this, in the global south, there have been many experiments in Africa, Ghana to mention one of them, certainly Latin America, Chile we try, and there's some countries still trying. And the question I want to ask, if you can summarize, you know, is that 
big one. What would be the lessons that you know the third world should sort of look into to try to not copy but use that as a framework to actually bring about development, equity, eradication of poverty, peace and prosperity. Thank you very much, Carlo, for your book. Thank you. Really appreciated uh, the, the, the talk and looking forward to reading your book. I like to draw you out a little bit more on the um, uh, the form of development within China in terms of um, the argument that is it a socialist country um, or is its development primarily state-led capitalism as opposed to the market-led capitalism of the West? And um, I think really just to improve my understanding. You know, in terms of the state-led capitalism that we saw after the post-war in the West and um, all of the advances in terms of the welfare state, um, public housing, public health, public education, uh, and the improvement in the universal uh, conditions of those countries, what, what makes this a socialist country? Um, in terms of it, it, if there are real differences between what we saw in the post-war in the West, which is now called state-led capitalism, and what is happening now in China. Um, I take it the point regarding um, multipolarity and the foreign policy and its anti-imperialist trajectory, but I'd like you just in terms of the domestic um, development that's happened in China, tell me how that's different to the state-led capitalism of um, those uh, countries after the war. Thank you very much. More questions? Would you let me come forward? Or? Um, <laughs> my question is very short though. Um, do you think um, in the future China intends to get rid of those elements of state capitalism and basically move forward towards full socialism, I guess. Thank you. Got it? Question? Question? Any more questions? Or do you want to just do this, this is one first? Uh, come out. <coughs> do I have to come? Yeah, you have to come here. My question is really real life question. Uh, this, uh, at the moment, we hear on television that Britain doesn't like people to come here. They may be sent to Rwanda, which is a nicer place. <laughs> <laughs> and among those who, who come here, there isn't a single Chinese. Although they say uh, out of every four human beings on, on this planet, one of them is Chinese. None of them come to England to ask for political asylum or some, some refugee child status. The reason why I'm asking this question is really, I, I, I received an, an email or a, a video saying that before the, just before the COVID, out of 161 million Chinese left China to other countries, either for holiday or business, and not one of them asked for political asylum anywhere else. They all went back. Not a single one of them decided to stay outside China. So we know the Chinese are attached to China. What i like to ask is, how is the situation of people wanting to go to China? Have you written anything about that? And how, how, how they are treated? Are they restricted? Are they prevented or shoved into a hotel three, you know, in one room or something like that? That's what I wanted to know. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I should just check if any of the speakers are particularly moved to come in on any of those questions before I do? Carol, if you give me the name, please, in the screen. 
Yes, yeah, sure. Um, Roger, did you want to come in on anything particularly? Okay, Danny, did you want to come in on anything particularly? <laughs> Rocio, please. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, lots of questions and not very much time. I will try and address some of these questions to the best of my ability. Some of them, to be honest, are quite difficult questions that I don't necessarily have the best information um, on the tip of my tongue. And um, others of them are simply complex questions that would take a very long time uh, to, to delve into in any re real detail. So there was a few connected or a couple of connected questions about, you know, has is what China's built sort of state led capitalism um, and going going forward, does China intend to eliminate those capitalist forms? Does China intend to dispossess um, the capitalist class, the class of people that do um, own and deploy capital? Um, ultimately, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways to approach this question. Um, but I think the key one, the key thing to bear in mind is the political aspect of it, which is what what social class is in power? What social class dominates political power in the situation that we're in? You know, we've had, you know, as, as the comrade pointed out, after the Second World War, we had a number of social reforms. We had the establishment of the welfare state. Um, we had the rolling out of free education. We had the rolling out of unparalleled um, social housing and so on and so forth. And probably that went further um, furthest of all in Scandinavia, so the, the, the famous Nordic model, where they've got capitalism, they've got social democracy, but workers by and large live a reasonably nice life. Now, the political basis of those reforms of the welfare state and of those what are essentially concessions to workers' struggle is A, the working class have fought for it, and the capitalist class has to give those concessions, B, this was all under massive pressure from the Soviet Union, who was the, you know, the Soviet Union was the big innovator in all of this. It was the Soviet Union that introduced uh, social housing. It was the Soviet Union that first gave women the right to vote. It was the Soviet Union that first made available universal education at every level. So as a response to that, in order to essentially quell revolutionary enthusiasm at home in the West, you know, the, one of the answers to that was social democracy. And you, you can tell that because the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. And as the Soviet Union was declining and stagnating from the mid-1970s onwards, that's exactly the time that these gains that workers here have won started to disappear. And where are those gains now? You know, we had social housing. You know, something like 20 or 30% of people in this country lived in social housing in the 1960s. But it's a tiny, it's a tiny percentage now. So because the ruling class, because the capitalist class is still the ruling class, it can grant concessions and it can also take them away again. You know, so all of these benefits are transient. Yes, at different times you can fight for different reforms and you can win certain reforms and that's an absolutely crucial component of our class struggle and our path towards socialism that, that hopefully we're all, we're all on. But any concession, any reform, any victory under capitalism is always a transient victory in a situation where the capitalist class is the ruling class. And that is ultimately the definition of a capitalist society, a society where the people who own and deploy capital are the ruling class and what they say goes. Um, and I quote this quite often, and apologies to those who've heard it before, but there's a, a Shanghai analyst in called Eric Lee, and he's interviewed in John Pilger's film, The Coming War on China. And he says, well, uh, he, he's asked by John Pilger, well, what, how's China different to the US? You know, uh, the US has got billionaires, China's got billionaires, the US has got markets, China's got markets. And he says, yeah, sure, we are a market economy and we've got very rich people and all of the rest of it. And we've got billionaires. But the big difference is that in China, the billionaires don't tell the government what to do. The government tells what the billionaires do, uh, tells the billionaires what to do, which is the opposite of the United States, which is the opposite of Britain, which is the opposite of the capitalist uh, society, where it's the rich 
that control the government and tell the government what to do. Um, so I think that's that's the fundamental difference. You know, uh, would, would I describe uh, the Chinese economy as state-led capitalism? Um, it's certainly you know it's certainly got some parallels with what was done in Singapore and and Japan to some degree in terms of state-led investment and regulation and all the rest of it. But ultimately, its basic logic and its basic orientation is towards meeting the needs of the working, working people who constitute the vast majority of the society. And yes, there are billionaires, there are rich people, there are capitalists, but they exist at the grace of the people's government. And therefore, there is a profound difference. In the future, does China intend to dispossess the capitalist class? Yes, because the, you know, China is run by a communist party um, and the goals of communist, uh, of communist society are a classless society where you don't have this division uh, between people who own capital and people who are you know, who, who've got nothing to sell but their labour power. Carlos, can uh, I just comment on Singapore? Yes. You mentioned Singapore, right? Singapore is fundamentally different from uh, China. While Singapore has so-called state capitalism, in Singapore, still money dominates politics, whereas in China. Politics dominates money. And a lot of people use Singapore, right, as if China is copying Singapore. A lot of people say that, and that is bunkum, that's nonsense. And Lee Kuan Yew, right, is the biggest traitor to the working class in Southeast Asia. So we can't compare Singapore with China. Singapore state is for money of the rich. China state is for politics for the people. Agreed. Uh, thank you. That is a very useful um, contribution. Um, yeah. Does China intend to dispossess the, uh, the the capitalist class? Yes, it does in the future. But who knows how long the future is? You know, China uh, characterizes itself as being in a lower stage of socialism, and dispossession of the capitalist class and and the creation of a of a classless society is considered to be a long-term project, you know, with, I would imagine that we're talking in terms of many generations, it will take uh, a lot of twists and turns and a lot of uh, zigs, zigs and zags to get there, but absolutely that's, that's the direction of travel for a, a communist party and for a Marxist-oriented society and for our entire movement, I believe. Um, we've got very little time. The position of women is a really interesting question, a really important question. Um, yes, women are underrepresented at the highest echelons in, in Chinese politics. Yes, uh, that's problematic. And, and you know, in that sense, China's well behind where uh, most of the kind of advanced capitalist countries are. Um, and I'm definitely not an expert on this subject, so there's only so much I can say about it. Um, a couple of things to bear in mind are like, what was their starting point? What was the position of women in China in 1949? It was an incredibly backward starting point where you know, the percentage of women who were entitled to education was you know, in, the, in the single figures. Um, foot binding was an absolutely normal thing. Um, the right, you know, women didn't have a right to choose who they married. They didn't have the right to divorce. They were, in many ways, for the vast majority of the population, slaves to their husbands. Um, so they've advanced you know, from feudalism and to the point where, uh, certainly at a legal level, they have equal rights, there's equal pay, and I think China's probably ahead of countries like Britain when it comes to equal pay for equal work. Um, they have the right, to, you know, of course, to, to divorce and access to the basic facilities of childcare and so on um, that are so connected with the oppression of women worldwide. Um, I feel like Rocio's got something more interesting to say than I have on this. No, no, it, it, it is true what you are saying. At least it, you have to, to begin to think what was the situation of the Chinese women at the beginning before 1949 and how they developed. But there is something that
that maybe in the West you don't see much. Women, Chinese women, are the free women of Asia. And that's very important. They are free if you compare them with the rest of Asia. And it is true, they are not at the top of the political, you know, scenario, the, 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 the Congress, the, the National Assembly, these things. But you can find them in economics as a CEO of great companies. Uh, they are engineers, they, are, they have a high education. They are free in their personal life, more than many women in the West. And then what you say is true. In the United States, even here, um, you have these feminist groups. Look and find, hmm, like a lawyer, a, a woman lawyer with the same skills that a male lawyer, and she will earn less than, than the male. That doesn't happen in China. So you have to understand the context, to understand that China, women in China, are equal to men. I was there nine years, and I can tell you that. Carl, you got one minute. I think, you know, we, we need to carry on this conversation because, you know, this kind of women, children being colonized is not, not, you know, just, you know, in, in China, you know, in the West, you know, Victorian time, you know, other time. So this is something, it's very problematic. People don't talk about what happened in the West and just pointing the finger what happened elsewhere. Yeah. So we need to talk, you know, drinks about women. Uh, we got one minute. We literally we run out of time, but then you might only want Papa. Sure. Um, well, thank you very much, Rocio, for that extremely important and insightful uh, observation and contribution. So yeah, we've run out of time. I think all that remains is basically to thank everyone for coming. Thank you so much to Iris, to Jenny, to Rocio, to Danny, to Roger for really important um, contributions that have added a lot of value to tonight's proceedings. Thank you so much uh, to the audience for putting up with me droning on, apart from anything else, but also for making time um, on a Tuesday evening when there were a million other things that you could have been doing. Thank you to everyone who's been who's joined us online. I hope you will uh, read the book. I hope you'll enjoy the book. I hope you'll get some value out of the book. I hope there'll be some, you know, some useful ideas that you can take forward in your own work, in your own writing, in your own research, in your own activism, in your own campaigning. Um, please, I'd be absolutely delighted to hear your feedback. You can purchase the book from the Praxis Press website. And, uh, uh, and for those people who are in the library today, you can also purchase the book um, uh, fr from here directly. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll go into all of that separately. Comment. Anyway. Sterling. Yes. yes. So, thank you very much, everyone. Still learning how to use this, everyone. Still learning how to use this. <laughs> how was that? How was that? How was that? All right. All right. We got about 170 people watching. I don't even know what I'm. Where's the chat? How much? I want to use the chat. For some reason, it's not letting me type in it. Can I type? No. Okay. Well, that was the event, everybody. All right. Keep liking the stream. I'm still on holiday until June. It's going to get kind of noisy in here. So I think I'm going to end it. Uh, yes, please. Let's see. All right. Well, everybody, I hope you could hear. Could you all hear? Just I hope so. I know it wasn't the most...
<laughs> All right, good, good, good. I'm glad. It's face towards me, everyone. Don't worry. You're not on camera. Everyone thinks they're on camera. All right, I'm still on holiday. Um, no rehearsal, no nothing. All right. Uh, all right, everybody. Good. Everyone could hear. I can't. I can't type in the chat, which is annoying. I can't type in the chat for some reason. So anyway, I'll give you a tour. There's Roger right there. Uh, there he is. And uh, there's Fidel. There's Marsh Memorial Library. There's the crowd. All right. It's a great turnout. Uh, keep liking the stream as you leave. It was really good to meet you. Really good. Um, yeah, so goodbye, and I don't even know how to end this, but I can't type in the chat. I, I hate this. Uh, all right, everybody. Peace out. Take care. See you later.